All right, DevOps for Defense, if you're ready to get rolling, we will start things off. A uh, couple things real quick. Uh, if, you haven't, if you haven't had any food, there's some barbecue up here. So I want to thank Jonathan from Tech Systems for showing up and supporting our meetup and giving us some, some, some really good barbecue. Thank you, Jonathan. And the Red Hat guys made the mistake of getting beer tickets. So if you would like a drink, come up here, say hi to the Red Hat guys and grab a beer. And uh, please stick around after as Coach Oakham uh, will go through and we'll start it. We'll be doing some music trivia once we're done here. So that's always a lot of fun. Um, today, a very special guest. We've got Red Hat who's come in. We're going to talk about infrastructure and code and Ansible. And we're going to talk about cloud native and how OpenShift can help us get to uh, containerized applications. All of this is super relevant based on last month's presentation where we talked about the DOD CIO's uh, recent paper called the DevSecOps Reference Design. If you haven't read that, it's up on our website on the blog or on the resources page. Go to DevOpsForDefense.org and download it. It's 90 pages. It's actually really kind of interesting to see how aggressive the DOD is in looking at these commercial practices and technologies and bringing them forward into our industry. So um, with that, we'll start with our code of conduct, as always. Um, obviously, this is an unclassified venue, so please, no dirty words. Treat each other with respect and professionalism. Please keep your private stuff private. Nobody wants to know about your secret sauce. Uh, but do talk about your experiences, what, what you need, what can help you um, share with others if you can help them solve their problems and ask others to help you uh, so you can learn as well. And as always, the guys here at Rocket, they, they set all this stuff up for us. They give us the projectors and the screens. They let us use their place for free. They're always super great to us. So please uh, return the favor and respect them on the way out. A couple of things to, to, to bring up real quick. Um, I just got back from the DevOps Enterprise Summit, and it was actually phenomenal. It was another great year. Um, quite a bit of really great content, and I'll be working to get some updates out on the blog from what we saw there. Uh, some great stuff out of, uh, out of people like Google. Even, even Walmart had a really interesting presence there this year. Learned a lot from a lot of different folks. So uh, keep an eye on the website and the blog for some info coming out on that. And then, of course, the big announcement is Gene has published or is about to publish a new book called The Unicorn Project. If you've read The Phoenix Project, um, this is, you can think of this as the follow-on. If you haven't read The Phoenix Project, please go do that now. Um, it's a narrative, and it, uh, it kind of wears the, the Phoenix Project took you down the path more of a, from an operations view. This takes you down the, the, the story from a development view, and uh, really, it really kind of pulls the whole thing together. It's a great book. Um, highly, I'd highly recommend it. And next month, we're going to go ahead and do a book club. So uh, show up next month. We'll have a handful of copies. I got 10 copies. Um, I've asked uh, Tech Systems to help us get a few more copies in here, and so next month we'll start a book club. We'll go through it and uh, see what our community thinks about it. Uh, of course, you can go and pre-order your own right now. Uh, they publish out on November 26th. So one thing I wanted to bring out, a little challenge for our community. One thing I learned about at the conference last week was this thing called Girls Who Code. Has anybody heard of Girls Who Code? So I, th I was oblivious. I didn't know this existed. I thought it was super cool. So first thing I did when I got home was I looked them up, girlswhocode.com, and I found that here we have uh, multiple chapters, Liberty Middle School, Discovery Middle School, the uh, Huntsville Boys and Girls Club, as well as the uh, elementary school over in uh, Decatur has multiple, multiple chapters. If you would like to help some young women kind of eliminate that, lower that uh, barrier to entry into uh, STEM and technology, please consider um, donating one day, one, a couple of hours a month um, to try to, to help bring new talent into our industry. And if, that, if you just can't make it fit in, uh, I did find out you can go to, if you have an Amazon account and you buy things from Amazon, 
Uh, you can support Girls Who Code through smiles.amazon.com and get a small percentage of your purchases go directly into uh, helping these young women get into the technology uh, industry. Um, unfortunately, Ms. Marshall is under the weather and couldn't join us tonight, but uh, hopefully she'll be able to come out and see us next month, tell us what they're doing. Um, we mentioned this last month. There is a local-ish DevOps conference called DevOps Days Chattanooga. Uh, I ran into uh, the gentleman who organizes this. And here on the page, if you uh, haven't bought your ticket and you would like to go, you can get a discount by going to that link. So uh, this will be up on our blog uh, tonight. Uh, this is next Tuesday. And uh, for with the discount for, for 50 bucks, you get coffee, snacks, food, lunch, a really a t-shirt. It's a really great conference uh, with some really great content coming. And we are looking to set up some carpools. I don't, we don't have details laid out yet, but if you're interested in going and would like to carpool, um, shoot me a note, let me know about it. Uh, I'll try to get some info to you. Uh, you can hit me at the, at the, the email address on our website. Next month, we will be celebrating our two-year anniversary, and we've got GitHub. Their lead engineer for DOD and the intelligence community is going to come down and give us an update on some stuff that they have been working on. Um, I'm very excited about that. And thanks to the, these guys for helping me organize a visit from who turns out is one of the newest Red Hat employees, Mr. John Willis, co-author of the DevOps Handbook, will be in town and will come talk to us. So I'm very excited uh, about that. John Willis has been uh, a real leader in the DevSecOps community for quite some time and uh, really has a great way of presenting valuable information and stories that, that really resonate with me. I think it's going to be amazing. So please come out and, uh, and join us for celebrating our two-year anniversary with a really big event. So what are we looking at going forward? Um, January, we've had some feedback. Maybe we need to get back to basics. What is this whole DevOps stuff anyway? So we'll, we'll step back. We'll just look at the core content uh, come, come January time frame. Um, I did run into this guy, Hans Doctor. He's the CEO of Gradle. And when he heard about what we do here, he was very excited to come and speak to our community. So. Um, He's asked if, if he could come in February and do a talk, show us what they're doing at Gradle, um, show us some of the work they're doing instrumenting builds and getting telemetry out of your builds. Uh, haven't got all that worked out and confirmed yet, but uh, he, was, uh, he was very excited about that opportunity. And uh, from the stuff he was, he was showing at the conference last week, I think it's something we would all really like. Uh, beyond that, talk to a few other folks. Um, Nicholas Shalon, he is the U.S. Air Force uh, Chief Software Officer. I talked to his colleague about coming down and speaking to us. Uh, that one, I don't have anything laid out or coordinated yet, but that's something that, that if it's of interest to this community, you might try to get him down here, as well as Dr. Mick Kirsten. Uh, he's a CEO at TaskTop and author of a book, Project a Product. If you haven't read that book, it's a phenomenal book. I would highly recommend it. And then we're talking about doing uh, maybe some kind of a hackathon. Look at you know some hands-on. How do we put these? You know the things that we learned tonight or in other sessions. How do we put that to practice? Um, if anyone thinks that's a good idea, we could uh, set something up here over a weekend maybe and uh, try it out. So with that, I would like to recognize Joe up here for uh, helping me get all this organized. Uh, so thank you to Red Hat and Joe. Um, if you could please come up here and meet Joe. Joe's got a big spool of tickets that uh, can help you enjoy your evening a little bit. It's all beer. It's all beer. A big roll of beer right there for you. Um, and our speaker tonight is Chris Reynolds. So Chris is going to walk us through a couple of different topics. Chris, off to you. I'm going to use that for a minute. Sure. Cool. No, it's not on. No, it's on. It is? Okay, you just have to hold it really close. Really awkwardly close. All right, my name is Chris Reynolds. I'm a senior cloud guy for Red Hat. I cover DOD and IC. So allegedly, according to this, I'm talking about Ansible and OpenShift, right? I was given like 200 slides, about 100 on each topic. These are 20 minutes a piece, right, we give or take? Who wants to do all of them? All right, so I'm going to kind of make it up as I go. All right, we're going to have fun. Who is using Ansible today? Show your hands. 
Come on. Anybody? Anybody? I got one, two. All right. You've called yourself out, and you. What are you using it for today? Automating configuration and deployment for uh, a cloud environment. All right. Automating the deployment of a cloud environment. That's one. You are the other one. Automation and deployment. Y'all are not giving me much to work with. Come on. Who's heard of Ansible? Okay, thank God. All right. We're now going to switch. Is this off? Okay. See, this is not working. See, I might have to stand on the X and it's still. We're just going to use this one. I don't like this one anyway. It's awkward. It's the headset. I need to pick up the pace anyway because I'm clock is ticking. So automation for all. What is Ansible? I'm going to stand in the corner. Hopefully this will work. Awesome. Now I'm not blocking everybody. Teams are automating, right? Not, not apparently in this group because two people rose their hands. So we need to get on that, right? So we've got the line of business. I don't know what that is, so don't ask me. Any of the other Red Hatters in here, can you tell me what line of business is? No. Nobody knows what that means on the slides. And in the speaker notes, they don't tell us. But it's there. All right? So we've also got networking. Any, any networking guys in here? Swing and a mitt. All right. I got one. Thank you for identifying yourself. Security. <clears throat> any ISOs? Any SA? Come on now. We're not going to mug you. I promise. All righty. Operations guys. All right, sysadmins, that's, that's infrastructure people. Developers. Ah, that's, that's bad for me. I'm an infrastructure guy. Java. That's all I know. Fortran. You got some punch cards to go with that? All right, and infrastructure. All right, that's where I come from. I build clouds. It's my job. Why Ansible? It is simple, it is powerful, and it is agentless. We're going to describe it as YAML. It's very, very readable. It's not Python. It doesn't suck. It just uses Python under the covers. It's agentless. Everything works via SSH and WinRM, right? So what can I do using Ansible? It is automating the deployment. It is the language of the enterprise. We used to initially just build it as like your infrastructure language, but now it's slowly becoming for security. Anybody heard of a STIG? It's about 400 lines of spreadsheet hell. Yeah. I can write that as a playbook, and if your security guy doesn't have his head up his ass, he can read it. But most of them do anyway, right? Yeah, we know. We've all been there. So, provisioning, continuous delivery, security compliance, config management, and orchestration. We're going to get into a few simple use cases and talk about infrastructure as code to a degree. Why this slide is up here again, I don't know, but it's literally... Just a different layout of the one three slides ago. So we're going to move along. Create, scale, and engage, right? Ansible engine, Ansible power, and we're all going to ignore this Ansible SaaS thing because it's in the cloud. And that doesn't work here, right? We're all disconnected. That's my assumption. I'm going to stick with it. Ansible engine is the CLI base. You're writing everything in Vim, maybe Atom.io if you're cool, or VS Code if you're kind of weird. Ansible tower, this actually gives our scalability, and it gives us our R back an API to hit. Our developers love API, and apparently that's what this room's full of. We literally give you the ability to automate everything you use. Huh. All right, networking guy. Is your stuff up there? Cisco? All right, we got you covered. Let's see, developers. Uh, I, I don't see, I know there's some GitLab guys in the audience, so we're just going to cross over Hub and make it GitLab. I got a laugh out of Dan. I'm happy. Jira, Jenkins, Slack for you developer folks. NetApp for your storage guys. Red Hat storage. Anybody? Bueller? No. Okay. RHEL, Linux, and Windows, and more. I don't really know what's in that more category, but it's there. Yeah, true. All right, universal language of automation. Simple, powerful, and agentless. Literally what you had four slides ago, it's here again in different form. I hate these slides. Thank you, marketing. They're terrible. All right, 
Right Ansible engine. It is cross-platform, right? That means write once run many, including human readable. Literally, if you can read English, you can understand what we're doing, and I'll have an example here in the next slide or two. The perfect description of application. I don't necessarily disagree with it. I don't like it. I'm going to use the terminology LAMP. Anybody know what that means? LAMP? All right. Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. I need RHEL. I need Apache to serve up my web app. MySQL as a database backend and PHP because, you know, it's old. Does anybody use PHP anymore? Dreamweaver? Dreamweaver MX? No. See, I'm running out of developer jokes. Version controlled. I'm just going to use the word git, but just imagine git and then the word lab next to it to satisfy the overlords in the back. So, version controlled. Infrastructure as code. Right? The developers are probably going to understand this a little bit. The ops guys are going to go, huh? I keep everything as a bash script, and it's stored in one folder on one server, and I don't know if my backup system's working. Sound familiar? Yeah, it's true. Sorry. So dynamic inventory, so we're going to get into that also maybe a little bit. Literally, it is, hey, Cloud, what you got running on you? I want to know. Because we all know we've kept them in spreadsheets, right? I need to go find the IP of this, address, of this server. I'm going to go to the spreadsheet. Yeah. Try typing that into to Ansible. It sucks. All right. Orchestration that plays well with others. ServiceNow, Infoblox, AWS, Terraform, Cisco ACI. From my networking homie here in the front, we got you. And more. All right. How does this actually work, right? Python parlor tricks is what this is at the end of the day. So at the bottom left, I'm going to attempt to walk in front of the screen to point. We've got this Ansible playbook, right? You're the user. This playbook's written. I need to execute it. We're going to execute. The playbooks are written in YAML. Tasks are executed sequentially. What does that mean? I'm going to call on somebody. They're executed sequentially. Chip, what does that mean? One after another. Right. So if I've got steps one through ten, don't start at step five. That's just a bad time, right? So they are executed sequentially. That is the thing to take out. So in this example, we're installing and starting Apache, right? Then we're going to install the Apache package tasks. We're going to make sure the index.html file is there and present. And we're going to start the service. So at the top, we see where it says hosts. That's web, right? What does that indicate? Anybody who knows? Yell it out. It's a group. That's right. So in the inventory file, which we'll show here in a minute, I've got a group of servers that are called web. It's just a bunch of web servers, right? Nice and simple. Become. That was probably me messing with the volume. Become is yes, right? If I need to install things, I have to have pseudo privileges, right? It's not that magical. I have to have root to do root things, right? We're declaring variables. For my developers, what's a variable? Let's see. I'm going to walk into the crowd. I'm going to come back until somebody speaks. And I'm going to stare awkwardly until somebody tells me what a variable is. What's a variable? What's a variable? What's a variable? Huh? You got one? What's a variable? It's a name thing that stores a value. That's right. They're no different than bash variables, right? So if I have HTTP port 80, now say when we get into this infrastructure's code, I'm talking about a source of truth, right? So for the developers, Ant and Maven is how you differentiate it between your environments, right? If I'm going to say this is dev, this is prod, my build variables are going to be different from when I actually deploy my application. For your infrastructure guys, what does this mean? In dev, say we're going to deploy on port 8080. Now, in production, we're going to deploy on port 80, right? So there's two extra eights in there and an extra zero. So if I have in my Git repository, now, if I'm doing this in bash, I'd have to have you know two different playbooks, all that fun stuff, or two different bash scripts. But if I'm using Git branches, everybody know what Git branches are? All right. So I've got one for dev, one for prod. Literally, the only thing I have to change is the variable. That's it. Does that concept make sense, bobbleheads? All right. Yes, I see some. I still see some confused stares. So what I'm getting at is I can write it once, and the only differentiation between, so if I do a diff between the two, is literally the port. So literally, the only thing that I'm going to have is a difference in a variable file in my dev branch is that variable and nothing else. 
because when I actually run the playbook, I'm going to say use this branch and execute this. So it's going to be different. So moving along to the tasks, name, yum, name, and state, right? Who can tell me what we're doing in that task? Somebody who's never seen Ansible before. Who's never seen Ansible before? Who is this the first time? Whose mind is being blown right now? Nobody's mind is being blown? Are we just taking these people's precious time before trivia? Is that what's doing it? What are we doing in the first task? You're right here. I have no idea. No idea. All right. In an effort of time, we're going to install a package called Apache, HTTPD, right? The next thing we're going to do is the latest index.html file is present. Kind of looks like a copy command. We're copying a file from one spot to the other. Anybody? Yes? Yes? All right. And we're going to start the service. So I've got three steps here that we're going to call tasks. And we're going to run them. Now, what's cool about this is, is this is idempotent. I know that's a big word, and it's late, and we've been drinking. What does idempotent mean? If I write this as a bash script, every time I run the bash script, it's going to install or attempt to install the package. It's going to copy the file, even if the file is the same on the destination. And it's going to attempt to start the service regardless of it being started. With idempotency, I've already run this once. I'm going to go run it again to ensure a state. It's going to go, hey, package is already installed. Move along. It's going to go, hey, we're going to copy this file. We don't need to. Why? Because it has not changed it from the source to the destination. It's the same. So it's going to skip this step. And it's going to go, hey, the service has already started. I don't need to start it. Why is this important? It's important because if I'm running this on five systems, I'm not really saving any time, right? When's if I'm running it on 500 systems? That saves me a lot of time, right? So this actually gives me the ability to speed up my execution time due to the impotency in Ansible. So modules are tools and toolkit. They are Python. They are PowerShell for our Windows guys. Any Windows admins here? All right. No Windows admins. Sweet. Any language extended. So in this case, we're, we're running Python Parlotrix when we execute a task, right? Plugins are the gears in the engine. It gives you code that plugs into the core engine, and it gives you the ability to adapt it. So we're, in this case, we're taking some variable, and we're going to make it pretty into a nice YAML presentation. All right, inventory. This is kind of crucial to how this whole thing works. So remember earlier I said we've got web? We've got web server one, web server two. Those are FQDNs. Yes, DNS has to work. Or an Etsy host, right? Then we've got a DB server. We've only got one. For my networking guy, we've got two switches, Leaf 1 and Leaf 2. And for our firewalls, we've got Checkpoint 1, and we've got an F5 load balancer. So we have the ability to have all these groups. What we're not demonstrating here in this example is you can also have childs, right? So if my web servers and my DB servers are all running rel and I need to update them, I can do web, colon, and then DB. So that means, hey, throw them all together, right? So I don't have to have two different tasks and two different playbook runs. I just say, cover everybody, and we're good, right? So literally, um, in the Ansible engine from the CLI, it is a INI-style text file. That's all it is. So like I said earlier, we have the ability to run against the cloud. OpenStack, satellite is not the cloud, but it's listed. VMware, eh, it could be cloudy-ish. AWS EC2, EC2, that's a real cloud. Rackspace, GCE, and Azure. Anybody using GCE here? And my streak continues. So what you have the ability to do with inventories is say, hey, AWS, give me a list of all the running instances right now. So it's going to take a Python script, hit the API. Yes, you have to have IAM permission set up properly. It's going to hit the API and get back a list of running instances. So you don't actually have to log in and you know create a spreadsheet of everything that's up and running because developers like to turn things on and not turn them off. They just leave them running. So it has the ability to go and give me a list of running instances without having to actually do any work on your part. So it's kind of nice. And I'm lazy. Who's, who's lazy? There should be more hands up. We're all lazy. They're just, oh, you're, oh, I like that. They're so lazy they can't even raise their hands. I like that. All right. CMDB, right? ServiceNow, Cobbler, BMC, 
Custom CNDBs. ServiceNow, pretty big here, I assume. A lot of people use that. Ooh, all right. That's a first. All right. Well, a good example is, say the, the user I hate the most in the world has once again locked their account. And they come to my cube, and they stand there until I do it. Four times a week, right? That gets old. So I've created a ServiceNow catalog entry for them that they log into, or they have somebody else log into it for them because they've locked their account. I type in their name. In this case, I'm going to use Jay Gavin, my rep. I'm going to pick on him because, you know, he's a rep and he's not technical. So he locks his account a lot, right? So Chip, sitting next to him, types in Jay Gavin for the fifth time this week and says, I need to unlock it. ServiceNow is going to go, cool. I know what to do with this because I've been dictated a workflow. Or a blue, I think the technical term is a blueprint, but whatever. So it's going to go, hey, uh, Ada, uh, yeah. Ansible Tower, I'm going to make an API call to you. That API call is a job template that says, hey, take this variable that I'm passing you. In this case, it's Joe Gavin's username, J, J Gavin. And we're going to run this PowerShell command against Active Directory in a playbook. And it's going to unlock Joe's account. All automatically. And it says, Tower's going to go, hey, I'm done. It's going to send it back to service now, and then it'll close out the ticket. All it takes is two minutes of Joe's uh, time to lock his account, three minutes of Chip's time to actually type his username in and click the submit button, and me as the admin, I don't have to deal with any of them anymore. How awesome is that? Yeah. So, automating everything. Like I said, it is the language of the enterprise, covering network stuff and all that fun stuff. We've got some example playbooks out there, Windows, compliance. And when I say compliance, I do mean the STIGs because, you know, we do write those in conjunction with DISA and then publish them. So when you have a security person that says, I'm really far off from the STIG, they're lying because we wrote it. Ours is closer than theirs are. That just means they probably don't know what they're doing. So check it out. I'll pause here for a minute for everybody to take photos. No. I got one guy frantically searching because he thinks I'm going to change it. See? Look. I'll go back. Networking. We've got a lot of good networking stuff. This includes actually backing up of your devices. So you can actually run a playbook to back them up every hour. So one of the things you get in Ansible Tower is like a cron. Say every hour, run a backup. Fun stuff like that. All right. Uh, how am I doing on time? How am I doing on audience interest? Yeah, do we want to get into Tower? I think it's got a lot of pictures. Hey, look, it's this again. What is Ansible Tower, right? It gives you our back. It's a role-based access control. It gives you a little button to push. I know you can't see it, but there's a little rocket right here, which is highly applicable for where we are right now. All automations are centrally logged. I like to call it the beating stick area. So it gives you the who, what, when, where, why. So I can see when Joe has logged in and he ran a playbook he wasn't supposed to or that he shouldn't have done without getting prior authorization, I can, now I can take it and go beat him up with it. So it's good to keep your ISO happy. Say, hey, I've got everything logged, including the job output, so we can see everything that was done. We've blue screened to death. Powerful workflows. Workflows. All right. What are workflows? Everybody know what a workflow chart is? If yes, then no. Same thing, but with playbooks. If this playbook succeeds, run the next one. If it fails, run another one. So push button, essentially log, like I said. like Literally, this is just the same thing again. I hate these slides. So Ansible Automation Platform, we run the playbooks. They run into the Ansible Tower as the user. So as the admin and the developer, say I'm going to write a playbook that I, as the code owner, has written to deploy the application. I put it into Git because I'm using Git lab. And then it's going to call from Tower. So Ansible Tower has the ability to pull from Git as its upstream source or SCM or Mercurial. No clear case. All right. It's landed with a few this time. So why are you shaking your head, Chip? You like clear case? You're weird. So. When I push an update into the Git repository, every time that job is run, I have the ability to do a Git clone to get the latest. So I can make sure I can run the latest and greatest. You can also turn that off. 
It's going to hit the Tower API, and it's still going to execute everything that we talked about earlier in Ansible CLI, because the engine still uses that underneath the covers. Uh, job templates, it's basically saying, I'm going to run this playbook against this inventory, aka this group of servers, with the credentials to log in. You have to have a, an account to SSH into. All right, it's not that magical. And then a project, which, like I said, is literally a Git repository. Why we're explaining inventories again, I don't know, but there they are. I love these pictures because nobody can see them. Absolutely nobody can see these pictures. But hey, credentials. What are credentials? It's what I used SSH in. It's called a service account. Everybody familiar with that concept? You don't log in as Bob, right? Cool. Moving along, a project. A project literally points to a repository saying, here's where I keep my playbooks and version control. Gives you a RESTful API. Developers, you all like that, right? Yeah, no, okay. The RESTful API literally just gives you the ability to call it and it is authenticated, right? So you can call jobs via an API from a third party application so you can write your own integrations. <sighs> RBAC, anybody know what RBAC is or do I need to explain role-based access control? Literally, role-based access control is all I need to explain. Okay. All right. Enterprise authentication. Azure, GitHub, Google OAuth 2, LDAP, Redis, SAML, and TACX Plus. It's all there. Centralized logging. So, like I said, you can send it to Splunk, Sumo Logic, Logly, and Logstash if you don't want to store it there in the tower interface. So, if you have a job that repeats every hour, and I actually see something that is not expected coming back, you can send it to Splunk and have Splunk do Splunkity things, right? Make a page call. Still carry pagers out here? No? Yeah, there's a few. All right. Workflows. Like I mentioned earlier, literally a flow chart. I start here. If it fails, I go here. If it works right, I go to here. It's literally just a workflow for playbooks. Nothing more. Uh, enabling your GitOps. Hey, we do have GitLab up there. Do you all want to take GitLab or do you want to take a photo? You want me to just kind of awkwardly do this and cover it for you? Where's Dan? I don't see Dan. Well, Dan's lost. All right. So automatically provision, update, and configure and apply. So this is part of that infrastructure's code. Your source of truth should be version controlled. If I'm saying LAMP, I want that to be my source of truth. So, like... In the VMware template world, turn your VMware templates of steps one through 10 of how I build a VM. That turns into a playbook. That playbook goes into your version control system. In this case, GitLab, right? Scaling, one of the cool things with Tower, you have the ability to cluster and scale out. Moving along. I don't like that slide. Collections, so what are collections? This is fairly new. It gives you the ability to lower the barrier of entry. So if I need something to do X, Y, Z, I can go see if it's already created because the collection's already there. And this is mostly done with partners, right? Cisco, VMware, Amazon. Kind of have a catalog, so to speak, online, and we'll show a screenshot here in a minute, to go and get prescribed playbooks to do whatever you need to do, like create a snapshot in VMware. Configure a Cisco ACI contract, which is awful. All right. So like I said, I have the ability to use the collections to bring things in. In this case, we're bringing in a custom ping module. It gives you the ability to search the collection for the path and still works. So if it's not there, it'll go out and get it, though this doesn't really work for you all because disconnected, right? Automation hub, that's a thing on the internet. Like I said, so you have the ability to go through and find certified content. Right now, we've got some prescribed stuff from Red Hat, Cisco, Ansible itself, and Google Cloud. So it's essentially, like I mentioned, saying, hey, there's a prescribed method to do X, Y, Z. Just go download it and then call the collection in like that. And you don't have to write all the playbook uh, YAML to do it yourself. Just does it for you. Next steps, blah, 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 getting started. Um, we have the Ansible journey. We recommend you start with the CLI. You don't want to start with Tower because out of the gate when you install Tower, it does nothing for you. If you don't have a playbook written, it ain't going to do anything for you but sit there which is fine, but it does nothing. So we, we talk about crawling, walking, and running, right? 
Crawling is, I'm going to take my bash scripts, whatever, something simple. I'm going to convert them into Ansible and go from there. I have the expected result. I know what it should be in bash. I'm going to get it with Ansible. Walking is, all right, this works. I've proved it out. Now my cube mate's going to start using it and a few more. Once I actually start getting into like enterprise and using teams, that's where Tower comes in. So where I'm doing it against a couple hundred hosts, you know, more than a hundred is general recommendation in my personal opinion. And when I have more than about five people using it, because then I need to start limiting access. I don't want to give the junior guy who's fresh out of college and never worked on a production system root level credentials, right? But if I'm the L3 guy, we'll say restarting a service in RHEL. That requires root. I'm the L3 guy. I write the playbook to do it. The junior guy can log into Ansible Tower as himself. He's restricted to just doing it on this one server and this one playbook. Clicks a little rocket icon and waits a few seconds, and it's done. He just did something root without a root level permissions without never actually going to the box. That's really where the power comes in and when you start having teams of teams. But out of the gate, it's useless. Right? All right. Seven o'clock. How am I doing? Was that interesting? Was that useless? Are we all here for OpenShift? Developers? Yes? No? Are we just here for the free beer? So, yes. so one cool thing I'll, I'll share with everybody with the uh, with the Ansible stuff, we were able to just we were able to use Ansible playbooks to take something that would be a whole team working for about a week or two to handle a deployment out into one of our environments. We we used Ansible playbooks to 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 build out and automate the whole process and took that down to one guy running one command and waiting four hours. So just going from a whole team of people for a couple of weeks to get something up and running in an operational context to a few hours was amazing. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Who knows what OpenShift is? Come on. Raise a hand. All right. Not really anybody. Do you know what a container is? Okay. All right. So, like I said, these slides are not my favorite. So, there's OpenShift. Questions? <laughs> it's multi-language. It's automation. It's collaboration. It's multi-tenant. It's secure. It's enterprise grade. I don't know why that's there. It's open source. Yeah, no, I mean, it's kind of what we do. Uh, it's scaling and it's standards based, right? So, I've got a few marketing slides and then I kind of go into what is a container. Do we want to get into what is a container? Yeah? Okay. All right. So apparently it gives you the best IT ops experience and the best develop developer experience. I'm not going to do my bomber impression, but just trust me on this one. Runs on top of a secure operating system, in this case, RHEL, or Red Hat Core OS, which is a company we acquired a few years ago. Above that is the Kubernetes. Who knows what Kubernetes is? Who pronounces it Kubernetes? Anybody? Yeah, there's one guy in the back. There's always one. On top of that, we've got the automated operations. And then on top of that, we bring in the application services, the cluster services themselves, metrics, chargeback, all that fun stuff, and developer services, so CI, CD pipelines, right? So how does this actually all fit together, and what do we bring in compared to saying vanilla Kubernetes? So with vanilla Kubernetes, you get all the namespace stuff. You get the scheduling that Kubernetes brings in. You don't get in the shared storage. You don't bring in the networking. So you have to bring that all in yourself. And even the networking with inside of the SDN for OpenShift is mind-bogglingly hard, right? It's not just as simple as creating some layer two bridges. So one of the things that we bring in is this entire platform, a bunch of worker nodes. We've got the master on the left-hand side. The master is your scheduler. It's your API authentication layer. It's your data store, and it deals with your scaling, right? So if I need to scale the pods out, which we'll get into that in a little bit, of what a pod is. The nodes themselves are actually the worker nodes. They receive the pod themselves. So if I'm having a clustered MySQL pod or clustered MariaDB, those get scheduled on the worker themselves, in this case, the rel. And they also give you the persistent storage and the registry. Everybody know what a registry is? All right, for those who don't, a registry is where I store my containers. So in the rest of the world where we're connected to the internet, Red Hat runs a registry, and you say, 
I want Maria DB. And you go, if I'm doing it from the command line, Docker run or cryo, Podman run. Podman run, Maria DB. It's going to go out to our registry and download it. For you guys, you'll have to run your own registry. Ours is called Quay. Right? So that's where everything's stored. In satellite terms, it's your repository for your RPMs. In this case, it's your repository for containers. The beauty of OpenShift is at this bottom layer here, it runs wherever RHEL runs. Want to run it in Amazon? Sure. Learn.openshift.com. You actually spin up your own little cluster. It just calls into Amazon. Bare metal, you have the ability to run on bare metal inside of OpenStack or inside of VMware because it is where everything that RHEL runs, it'll sit and live, right? So let's get into what Linux containers are. What are containers? It depends on who you ask. Infrastructure and applications coming together. Holding hands in harmony. No, that one didn't land. Application processes on a shared kernel. It is a simpler and lighter than a VM. So when you have a VM, you bring everything, including the operating system, on a hypervisor. I have 10 VMs. I've got RHEL running as the KVM hypervisor, and then 10 VMs on top of that. That's a lot of RHEL kernels to track and maintain. With containers, I have the ability to tap into my host, in this case, the node, as we're calling them, or the worker node, and share that single node amongst multiple containers and that single kernel, but it's all segregated by a namespace. Gives you the ability to bring the portability across environments. So it's only going to actually ever bring what I need. So if I just need a particular library, it's just going to bring that one library and not all of them with me, depending on what my application needs. So it packages it with all the dependencies and essentially what is a tar file. And we'll get into the what tar. Everybody familiar with what a tar file is? Tar.gz. That's all it is. It's a zip file. Right. No, that didn't work. Deploy into environment in seconds. Like I said, they stand up pretty quickly, and they're easily accessed and shared by a registry. So the difference between them, the VMware isolates the hardware with the hypervisor itself, and you have your single kernel across it, and then you have your OS dependencies, and then your multiple apps on top of them. On the container side of that all, hypervisor and hardware are the same. You have the container host, in this case, with the kernel, and then we've got four containers, but they're all running different applications or the same in their own OS dependencies. They're all segregated out. I think I just saw a light bulb moment here in the front. Did we? You want to take a photo of that one? Remember, put it on the wall. What did I learn today? Put the pen up in the cube. I actually like this one. It kind of explains it pretty well. So with the virtual machines, you get the VM isolation, right? So because you have multiple operating systems running at once. It is a complete US OS, static compute, static memory, and high resource usage. So you can't get as dense on a hypervisor as you could compared to the container side. So on the container side, you do get the isolation. Anybody ever heard of a little thing called SE Linux? Yeah? All right. Well, that's one of the ways we do it with SE Linux context. You do have that shared kernel across everything, so which is good and bad, especially if you're using the real-time kernel. It's a good thing. You have your burstable compute, your burstable memory, and low resource utilization. It's denser, so the re lower resource utilization is going to come in if only spinning up the, prods, the pods that I need and making a lower memory request into the memory table. Next. All right. Kind of didn't work there. Virtual machine. Another slide on this. Clear ownership boundaries between dev and IT operations drives the DevOps adoptions and, for, and fosters your agility. So IT ops... They are responsible for the entire operating system, including the application, which is a lot of work, unless you have Ansible, right? The answer to that question is yes. Come on now. I know it's late. What are we doing? 707. I'm hurrying, okay? I know I'm between y'all and trivia and more beer, which, by the way, you know, just go get more beer. I'm talking either way. So, all right. On the container side... IT ops, you're only going to be responsible for the container host, so the actual layer that runs under it. And also, this includes your security accreditation. It's not your responsibility to accredit the application. It's the developer's responsibility, which is really nice. Less paperwork, right? Sorry, developers. More paperwork. Welcome to spreadsheet hell. The developers themselves are actually going to be dependent upon the operating system. So for the containers themselves, I can have a Ubuntu container. I could have a RHEL container. I could have a CentOS container. Whatever you need for your application, right? So we've heard like, 
I can only run this application version on this operating system version on this certified hardware version, right? The ops guys hate you. Java 1.5, it still lives, right? Because some stupid COTS app requires it. We can fix that, right? Regardless of the underlying operating system, we can modify the underlying library that's needed because the container only brings what it needs. So, yay, happiness, right? Virtual machines are not portable across hypervisors and do not provide a portable packaging for applications. So, the laptop, I don't like this slide. Essentially, what this slide is saying is if I'm taking a VM and trying to move it from the cloud to on-prem or vice versa, it kind of sucks, right? It's not easily exportable from whether it be one of our products or from a competitor's product and moving it. Containers fix that, right? So if I built my container for my application, I don't care if it's running down here, up there, on the Mars rover, it's fine. Because that's the, the ability and that's the that's what you get with the container itself is you can just move it wherever it wants because it brings what it needs to and nothing else, right? Uh, rel containers plus rel host equals guaranteed portability across any infrastructure. What's the key here? Run rel, right? Because you get that compatibility layer across it. That doesn't mean I can't write my container on rel and then go run it on a different Linux That will work. But with that guaranteed portability of running OpenShift wherever row runs, it makes your life easier. All right. Rapid security patching using container imaging layer. Poor example of how we're going to explain what a container is. So on the right-hand side, we've got base rel, an OS update layer, because say a vulnerability came out and we need to patch the underlying rel portion in the container. On top of that, we've got good old Java. We'll just say 1.5, because I like picking on 1.5, and the app layer. So I've got, on the left-hand side, a couple different layers. Now, remember how I said it's just a tar file? Each layer is just a tar within a tar. So layer 1, the base image, has version 1.0 of said application. Java releases its 95th update for 1.5, or whatever number we're at now. I know 1.5 is not supported anymore, so pick the newer version and pick update number 200. I have to actually patch it, right? So that becomes image layer 1 with the newer version of Java. So between the base image and image layer 1, there is an increment in the Java uh, library itself. Now, say for the application, we released a new update, right? We changed the color of a button for the 50th time. So that becomes layer 3. So in layers 1 and 2, the button was blue. In layer 3, it's now a lighter blue because that's what was learned in you know, feedback and Q&E and testing of it's a better of this shade. So moving along into layer 3, it still contains everything from the previous layers, but we've changed something else. Is that making sense of what a container is? Tar avatars just containing the diffs across everything. So cryo, yeah. Cryo is a runtime that plugs into Kubernetes that we have shipped and supported. It is a lightweight, lightweight OCI compliant container runtime. So containers, we push for a standard that's out there called OCI compliance, which gives you a guaranteed running experience across multiple platforms and providers. So whether you're using us or another one, if it's OCI compliant, it'll run because we support that uh, standard, which includes Docker. A container is the smallest compute unit, right? Containers are created from container images, so the binary moves into a runtime itself when we're actually running the container and running it. Container images are stored in an image registry. So that was that block on the right-hand side that we pointed out earlier. It's just a repository of where they all live. And when I say, I need to go get MariaDB, it goes out to the registry and downloads the latest. One thing I didn't get into, and I don't know if these slides do, are tagging. So back here on these image layers, you have the ability to tag. 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and latest. By default, you always want to have a latest. So I have the ability to say, mm, latest is not working right for me because this version of MariaDB is clustering, and I don't feel like setting clustering up. I just want one, so let me go and use an older version. Something like that. That gives you that ability with tagging. Oh, wait. Shit. I screwed that one up. Oops. 
It's right here. So my registry slash front end, like I said, 1.0, 1.1, 2.0, and latest for the container images. And the same for Mongo. So I have the ability to say podman run Mongo, D, Mongo colon 3.4, and it's going to go, okay, I'm ignoring latest 3.6, 3.7. I'm just running 3.4. So it gives the ability to cherry pick if you need certain features or capabilities that were removed or deprecated, blah, 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 in the registry, from the registry, sorry. Containers are all wrapped in pods, which are units of deployment and management. So a pod, what is a Kubernetes pod? In the speaker notes, it describes it as, I am supposed to describe it as peas in a pod, right? Three peas in a pod. Huh? Yeah. So in a pod, I'm going to say I need to run my application, and each pod is going to contain three instances. Pods have the ability to scale up, and with one of the things you get within OpenShift is the ability to auto scale. So if I'm monitoring the HA proxy that's coming in, and I notice that mm, we're starting to hit a threshold of users, I need to scale, it just deploys more. And that's one of the features of Kubernetes and OpenShift, and saying, hey, OpenShift goes, hey, Kubernetes. Scale those pods. I need more peas. In addition to this, inside the pod, they all sh share their networking. So you see we've got the two IP addresses there. There's two containers sharing the same because those are handled via localhost. So within the networking namespace isolation, it handles all of that and abstracts it out. Pods configure is, defi is defined in deployment. We call it a deployment config, which you specify the, or yeah, deployment config. An image name, replicas, aka how many do I want. Any labels, so aka what that version is for that container, like I said, CPU, memory, and storage, right? So how many, how much CPU, how much memory, and how much storage am I going to give it? So one of the things you get with an OpenShift, like we mentioned earlier, is storage compared to like vanilla Kubernetes, where you have no storage backing in for persistent storage. And you have the ability to assign those all to a depo the pods for the containers. All right, the service layer, we provide an internal load balancing and service discovery area across the pods themselves. So. What does this mean? The easiest way to explain this is, is when I spin up an application, I have a, a wildcard DNS entry for star.apps.mydomain.com, right? Say it's web, oh, you know, web app one. It will automatically create the route on the infrastructure. The master will say infrastructure, create these routes into the SDN. It will automatically, any DNS request going to the server is going to route to the master. Master is going to go, oh, I know what my, web, my app one is. I'm going to route it internally to these pods. So the backend service speaks to the pods and handles that all for me. It's actually kind of cool. It makes your life a lot easier than trying to manage it all in a spreadsheet and mainly create the DNS entries. So apps can talk to each other via these services. So we invoke the backend API and the backend services. So for interpod communication, aka I've got a pod for my web app and a pod for my database server, you're not actually going across like a class C. Uh, IP address and out and then back in, it's all handled internally across the namespaces at the kernel level, which means it's faster and is cooler and it's more secure and makes the ISO happy. So routes add services to the external load balancer and provide readable URLs for the app, like I mentioned. So in this case, appprod.mycompany.com. So the containers speak to the backend service. The backend service goes out, like I said, and creates it. And the DNS wildcard entry points to master and master goes, cool, I got you, bro. You go here. Basically, it's like a NAT. Everybody familiar with natting? You do it at home, 192.168.0.1 for your Linksys router, plugged into your Comcast modem. Same thing, just cooler. Projects give your isolation across environments, teams, groups, and departments. So one of the features that we, bring, we have in OpenShift is the concept of a project. So each user can have their own project. Each team can have their own project. Each enterprise could have their own project. So one OpenShift cluster can have hundreds of projects, and we do have customers doing this, and it basically gives you the ability to have your playground and your sandbox and not delete your neighbor's stuff, right? In VMware world, everybody can see everybody's VMs, stuff like that. You have to log into the console, but you only have access to a few, but you can still see them. This gives you more isolation and protects stupid people from doing stupid things. So the architecture itself... I don't know why these are in here. These are the same slides from earlier. They're pretty awful. Apps that run in the containers themselves. So the worker nodes, like I mentioned earlier, those and the pods run on the compute nodes or worker nodes, whatever terminology you want to use. Kubernetes schedules them on there from the master and says, go forth and do. 
and they are your unit of orchestration. Masters are on the control plane. The control plane itself, like we mentioned earlier, handles your API authentication. I told you these slides are not good. Here we are talking about this all again. I just have to click through them every single time now. Data store and your scheduler, we handle your registry, your health and scaling. So when, I, when a pod goes down, if for some reason the process dies, the PID dies, Kubernetes from the master says, hey, spin that pod back up because I, by my definition, have to have three of my web app running at every single time. And if for some reason we have an influx of if we have an influx of traffic, it goes, hey, we're starting to hit a critical threshold. We're now going to scale up to six, and so on and so forth. So that's all handled inside of it. Persistent data, like I said, we give you a persistence volume store uh, by default that's outside of it, usually with Ceph or Gluster, depending on your choice, and that is HA, right? Routing and load balancing, we also handle all of that, like I mentioned earlier. These slides are very repetitive with the startup maps. One dot example that we did dot com that I did earlier, right? You also have the ability to access it via the web, the CLI, an IDE, and an API for your developers and for your operations folks, right? That's it in a nutshell. There's like a hundred more slides, and I'm not going to do this to you all. That was literally open sh an hour, usually a minimum hour, in like 15 to 20 minutes. Questions? Are we all just that excited for trivia? Sounds like trivia. Thank you. My name is Chris Reynolds. I'll be around for a little while longer. Here you go, man. Oh, All right, Chris, thank you so much. So I hope you guys got the sense that uh, a lot of what's going on here is really important from a security point of view, uh, giving us the isolation in the container world from app to app, giving us the ability to deploy things effectively from a configuration manager basically allows you to really shift everything left, uh, which is exactly what we're trying to do, trying to get that capability and shift that security cap that security posture left, configuration manage everything, and deploy it in a re reliable, repeatable manner. Uh, this gives you huge amounts of flexibility as you go through and do that. So. As always, a reminder, we've got all kinds of resources out there for you. Um, you can get it on our, on our website under resources. I wanted to highlight two new, new entries here. I already mentioned the Unicorn Project coming out uh, November 26th. You can pre-order your copy. It's a great book. Um, and we always have the State of DevOps report up. Interestingly, this year's State of DevOps report uh, 2019 is available for download now. Go Google it. You can find it. Um, it really focuses on the security aspects. Pay, if you're paying a close attention, what you're going to see is that security is all over the place right now. It's really coming into the forefront. Everything that you just saw here with Ansible and OpenShift is a big security push forward. And uh, you can see it in the literature and the documentation and the, the guidance that's coming down um, in a, from our uh, community. So with that, that can uh, the speaking portion. Uh, I invite anybody who would like to join us for a lean coffee. We'll sit down and do this very quickly. If you've never done a lean coffee, it is a lot of fun. Uh, grab a few chairs. We've got some tables set up around here to do this. And the way a lean coffee works is we'll just uh, nominate someone at the table to be a facilitator. That will do a, a short introduction, um, maybe introduce each other, and then. Take some cards. We've got cards and markers out here. Just take a card and write down any topic that you're interested in talking about. Maybe it's related to something that Chris had, has presented. Maybe it's something uh, related to containers in general or managing containers or anything like that. And then once you have your topics laid out, you're going to vote. Everybody gets three votes, and a vote is a dot. Put a dot on a card and... Uh, and then we'll order those votes. We'll order them by the number of dots that you have. And then we'll just work through them. Each, we'll go through each topic. Uh, we have the green cubes of doom out. We'll give a five minute timer for that topic. And whenever the timer's up, we'll vote. We'll say, do we want to keep learning on this subject? Have I learned everything that I need? Or do I want to defer to my friends at the table? And then we'll move on. So that is it. The topics based on Chris's talk I thought might be useful is, hey, this cloud thing isn't for us. Security is code, which Ansible is a huge enabler for. And uh, hey, is this going to automate my job away? 
which we hear a lot. So those are some suggestions uh, to get the lean copy started, but certainly not mandatory. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed Red Hat. And once again, Chris and Joe, thank you so much for coming out and, uh, and talking to our community. Very great to have you. Thank you.